So th there's a, a bit of a recurrent theme on, on Ring Knocker. We keep meeting these active duty officers who are managing to do just unbelievable entrepreneurial stuff in their spare time, right? It's, it's just incredible, right? I mean, uh, you guys remember Stuart Grazer with the, uh, the real estate empire, right? And he's also, you know, playing XO on active duty. I, I don't know how they do it. So Jordan, Jordan Foley is another example. He's Navy class of 2012. Uh, he's got a master's degree from MIT. Uh, now he's at Georgetown University studying law. So a super underachiever. Uh, apparently, uh, Jordan had too much time on his hands at law school, so he put together this incredible company that, um, I mean, come on, 2020, right? This is a restaurant apocalypse. And, uh, and Jordan found the, the one corner of the restaurant industry that's actually totally thriving uh, and is uh, opening it up to veterans. So uh, Jordan's here to tell his story, along with Amy, who's one of his key tech partners, and Adonis, uh, who's going to tell us the uh, the boots on the ground version of the of the food truck story and uh with that guys um the floor is yours uh, tell us uh tell us your story thanks so much jason appreciate the the introduction and uh for having sure. all of us on and um yeah i want to introduce myself i'm jordan foley class of 2012 naval academy and i started uh chow it's a uh Nonprofit, we're a 501c3. We're incorporated in Maryland and uh, we plan to have national reach. But what we do is we take veterans and military spouses and teach them the ins and outs of the culinary industry through food truck operations. So you can think of us almost like a food truck MBA. Uh, we're not only teaching you how to operate the truck, we're teaching you the subtleties of marketing, branding, the supply chain support you require everything that goes into all the regulatory environment that surrounds food trucks. If you know you had, if you research food trucks for about five minutes, you'd probably understand that if you go from Montgomery County to Anne Arundel County, you have a different set of regulations. And that's actually really challenging. And Adonis will tell you too, um, when you're doing it or when he was doing it completely on his own, um, that two hour profit window that a lot of food trucks see uh, as being really their, their largest uh, you know, earnings period, that, that's really when you want to focus, but he's probably you know, also doing all the marketing prior to that, all the supply chain, all the prep and everything that. So what we do at Chow is we help get veterans and military spouses into trucks and into industrial uh, slash commercial kitchens to train. And think of it, all you Navy people and Marine Corps too, think of it almost like a PQS system. We have under instructs, we have knowledge factors that are, you know, we have a digital training platform, we have an in-person training platform. And what's great is actually Peter Jukov is on this call too, and I'm going to, you know, call him and Ink Tattoos out because they provided us with an awesome funding uh, source where we have what's called Chow uh, Kitchen with a Mission. So every month we actually uh, ask a business, usually a veteran owned business to give us money to supply meals to the homeless community. And what we do is we cook out of our commercial kitchen in Chevrolet, where we will have one or two veterans or military spouses simulate a restaurant environment and get 200 meals out to a homeless shelter in the area. And we give them you know, training credit for that as part of our program as well. And Peter and Ink Tattoos were awesome enough to sponsor the last event. And it went off you know, very well. We supplied 200 meals to Silver Spring, Maryland. But we don't just do the training and all of that. Um, we also do cookware donations. This year, we actually donated $30,000 worth of coffee equipment to veterans starting bakeries during COVID. Uh, that coffee equipment actually came from the United States Naval Academy. They shifted uh, coffee suppliers this year. And if you didn't know, when you shift coffee suppliers, the equipment actually goes with that supplier. Uh, so they were either going to repurpose it or do something. So they actually gave it to me. I cleaned it up and gave it to uh, three different veterans starting bakeries. And, uh, you know, they couldn't be happier. It saves them thousands of dollars uh, in this large scale industrial coffee equipment. So we do that as well. Um, we are sustained through donations. We are a 501c3, so we ask for individual donations. And right now, um, that is how we are getting our funding. We want to buy our first truck rather than using other people's trucks and leasing them or doing whatever it is to do to get our hands on a truck or a kitchen. We actually want to buy our first truck and use that as our first mobile training unit. And what we're going to do in 2021 here is we're going to prove that concept that that mobile training unit works and is effective. And then from there, we actually want to add a truck or, or two to our fleet every year. Uh, we're in operation to then extend our reach. But also we want to prove that if we can get a veteran into our system, lower that overhead and then lower the startup cost for them, train them for anywhere from six months to a year to reduce that 50% fail rate that a lot of food trucks see within their first year. 
um, then we're actually serving the veteran community and military spouse community by prepping them and giving them a safe training environment to learn the ins and outs of food trucks. And then from there, we have preferred builders for food trucks that we trust in the area. We'd be able to actually coordinate them getting their own truck, branding, you know, all that stuff that goes into it and setting them up wherever they are, Denver, Colorado, Annapolis, Maryland, San Diego, California, we could do it all. So that's where we're going. Right now, we are doing all the things I mentioned with training, and we are in a season of giving right now. So whenever you check us out at letschow.org, uh, you can see all the fun ways um, you can kind of support us, whether it's donations, and we actually send you some stuff in the mail uh, for donation levels. But also, if you just want to buy cookware for some friends and family this year, uh, we partner with Pampered Chef, and we get 15% back of your purchases from Pampered Chef. So that's that's really us in a nutshell. Um, you can see it since I graduated from the academy in 2012. The food truck industry has increased 79% to like a 1.2 or $3 billion industry now. Um, those are incredible numbers, right? Like that, that's all of us business minds are perking up, but I do want to alert you to a couple other numbers that I think are really important and we need to think about. Um, the first number is that Four out, of, four out of every 10 post 9-11 veterans uh, believe they suffer from some form of post-traumatic stress. The other one is 63% of veterans are, le are likely to leave their first post-military job within two years because of lack of opportunities or job satisfaction. And then the last one is 22 veterans every single day die by suicide. Those are the numbers that we actually care about at Chow. We're trying to reduce that every day. We have cooking therapy sessions and we're trying to expand a cooking therapy um, lab that we're gonna do post COVID. But also um, we want to see veterans succeed, military spouses succeed. So at our heart, um, yes, we do food trucks, but we truly are a nonprofit um, empowering veterans through the culinary arts. And Amy helps us so much with our tech and, and what we're gonna be able to do with our truck. And, you know, just hear, you, whenever you hear from Adonis too, you're going to hear the boots on the ground, like Jason said, and it's, this is going to be a, a nice little panel to kind of give you the holistic look, but what Chow does um, is actually we're unique in the nonprofit sphere there. We actually are the only nonprofit in the nation that focuses on food truck operations for veterans and military spouses. So I'll leave it at that. Um, thank you very much. And, uh, you know, I'm excited to kind of tell you more and tell you where we're going, but I'll, I'll pass it off to, to Amy now to keep the batting order going. Jordan, that was great. Thank you so much for that overview. And, and I feel exactly the same way. It's been an absolute pleasure working with you and growing our businesses together. And uh, Jason, thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate this opportunity to talk about Curbside Kitchen and um, also bringing Adonis along as one of our really premier partners on our platform. So to give you a little bit of background, my name is Amy Katz and I started Curbside Kitchen about three years ago. And I started the company with my husband and his name is Brian and he's a commercial real estate developer and he owns a company called um, American Real Estate Partners in Virginia. And one of the reasons that we started this company together is because we saw a very big problem and the problem it is in commercial and residential properties in the real estate space. There's um, building owners are constantly looking for ways to differentiate themselves, the building owners, figuring out what are the best amenities to have on site, figuring out how to provide food options to the people in the buildings, whether there be stale cafeterias, limited food options, high costs of delivery services such as Grubhub and DoorDash, and how do building owners figure out a way to get food to the people in the building as an amenity. What we were also hmm. seeing at the same time is the absolute love and passion and desire for food trucks to be vending at these properties, at commercial and residential properties. So we were looking at this and thinking to ourselves, boy, there's all these food truck owners out there. There's nobody really helping them to figure out where to vend, how to be, um, as, as uh, Jordan said, vending in the proper locations, how to make sure that the customers are aware when they are out there, and how do we provide a service to the property managers that are inundated with other tasks, and how do we connect the property managers and the food trucks. It's a very complex relationship and create a system, essentially a better mousetrap, and to connecting the food truck owners, the building owners, and the customers all together. So what we did is we have completely modernized a very antiquated business. So essentially we built a technology-based platform that aggregates, now we have over 500 trucks on the platform, and we deal with all the complexities of booking and scheduling 
and marketing for our food truck partners and the building and landlord partners that we work with. So we started with Brian's Buildings, just to give you a little bit of background, just to sort of test out the model. I started with five food trucks. I'm like, okay, how do we take the pressure off the property managers and provide opportunities for the food truck owners? And we built out our technology platform with just five food trucks and essentially five buildings. And what we realized is, wow, we have a really amazing business here. And so fast forward three years, we now have, as I mentioned, 500 inspected, vetted, insured food trucks on our platform. We work with over 250 residential and commercial properties on our platform. Adonis is one of our just, I mean, he is a standout, which is why he is here today to talk about his business. And we work very closely with him. So what we do is we're a logistics platform. We have an app. Um, that has, as I mentioned, aggregates all the food trucks onto one platform. And we work with all of our landlord partners to make it really simple to book and to vend for the food truck owners. Um, We're an interesting business because we are providing opportunity to our food truck owners that have really a very difficult time trying to not only cook their food and be culinary experts, but to find spots to figure out how to get people to come out of the buildings when the food trucks are out there. And essentially, not only now that it's, you know, we're in a pandemic, but even before um, COVID, we were always thinking about ways to modernize and create a frictionless, contactless platform. So now people have the opportunity through this platform to mobile order, designate pickup times, designate, you know, when they'd like their food to be picked up. They can see their orders in progress. They can see confirmations. They can come out to the food trucks, avoid the lines, really respect social, you know, aggregation. Whereas before food trucks, and I think Adonis would agree with this, were very much um, an opportunity to, for socializing and aggregating people together and, and bonding and, and, you know, creating a sense of place. And, and that really has changed now. And people are looking for just delivery of food, safe, individually packaged meals. And that's where the food truck owners fill such a critical void. And they can really help with this large volume of deliveries, which nobody was expecting and provide an amazing restaurant quality experience at a very affordable price. And that's what I love about this business. I am so proud of of what we have built here. It's a very unique business. And when we align ourselves with people like Malaya's Kitchen, and with some of our other partners, we are really figuring out a way to differentiate ourselves amongst all the other businesses that are out there that are serving food, because we are, again, providing opportunity to small business owners that may not have these opportunities. We're providing a quality experience for the eaters, and we're also taking the burden away from property managers and landlord partners who are essentially bogged down with how to do this and how to source these opportunities through the food trucks. I know it's a mouthful. I want to give Adonis a turn to, but that is um, really just the foundation of my business. We're in Philadelphia, North Carolina, and the DMV, and we are doing a rapid expansion and scaling to uh, really throughout the country at this point. So talk about boots on the ground, roll up the sleeves. This is a gritty business, but it is something that I have so much heart and passion about. Uh, One last thing, and then I'm going to let Adonis speak. Uh, one of the really key components to my business and something so important, and Adonis can um, talk more about this too, it's called Chasing Flavors, Curbside Cares. And what we do is we go out to communities that are in need of food, whether it be people that are food insecure or homeless. And every month we go out to particular destinations and communities where we give back and serve food. Tonight we were at an organization called So What Else? And we were in Rockville, Maryland, and we just killed it. It was so fun. Adonis and I were out there and we served, I don't even, I think he served over 160 meals to people that do not have food. He donated food himself. Curbside Kitchen donated food. So what else donated food? And the the people were just so happy and so excited to receive a hot meal. Adonis prepared a beautiful spread it's just a feel good company. It truly is. We are not, we are not a nonprofit, <laughs> but however, I look at um, curbside cares as a very critical piece of my company. And we do that every month with various organizations, which is how I met uh, Jordan. So I'll pass the baton along to Adonis and he can tell you more about what he does. Uh, good. Good evening. Um, Jason, first, um, thanks for um, 
being a visionary with what you're doing here. Um, and Amy, thank you for the opportunity to join you here. And more importantly, Jordan, thank you for being a maverick. Um, it's important to have people with, with a heart to serve like you. And, and hello to all of my fellow um, veterans that are on the call tonight. Well, I'm Adonis Adams, like uh, Amy mentioned. Um, in my real world, I'm a, a deputy program manager over at NIH. I have about 70 employees. I'm in charge of all of the IT uh, for the National Institute, NIH. Um, I run the entire infrastructure for NIH. But I'm a kind of cheat and fast forward about the food truck business for myself. Um, I kind of cheated in the food truck business in the sense of I've had several businesses before, and I took my business sense and I incorporated it into the food truck world, right? And I, and I really want to encourage you, Jordan, to keep doing what you're doing because when you look at what you guys are doing, um, when you look at the most successful business models and more importantly, the most wealthiest people in the world, they figured out problems. They figured out solutions to problems before people even realized they had the problem. Right. And that's why it's so important to have relationships like Amy and other and align myself with other visionaries, because now we never knew the code was going to happen. Right. And so had Amy thought about this idea next year. Right. It probably wouldn't be as effective because now there's a necessity to um, to a point to bridge the relationship between people who want food and people who need access to food and the convenience of getting it right there to them via a food truck. And so, you know, thank you, Amy, for being a visionary and, and seeing it a few years back. And now that I think it's the most, and I told you this before, Amy, I think this is the most beneficial time um, to be a food truck owner. But I'll tell you this, guys, just to say, it's a lot of work. You know, a lot of people see the lines, they see the food, and they see, but they don't understand the, the, uh, the background of what it takes to get to that point. Um, and Amy and I were talking earlier and I, and I kind of like what Jordan is doing as well, is helping people to understand the logistics of operating a food truck, not just serving people, not just finding a good location, not partnering with Amy and getting these events. It's really about the back end and how you get there. Because when you think about food and you think about health and you think about safety, and more importantly now with, with uh, social distancing and COVID, you know, you have to be mindful that you're, you're, you're literally um, uh, uh, dealing with people's lives and health. And that's why it's important, Jordan, for people like yourself to do what you're doing and helping people to understand the back end side of it. Because at the end of the day, you know, we're, we're, we're really dealing with people's lives. You know, and I take that very seriously. Amy and him know that I take that very seriously. And, and that's one of the things about the food truck business that people don't think about in the sense of being a food truck owner. They think about, oh, let me get, I'm a chef. I, got, I want people to taste my food. And they get out there not understanding that, hey, there's a whole other part to this business outside of just giving people food. Right. And, I, and, I, and from my own experience, um, I've been fortunate enough and now I do a lot of consulting. I, I'm in the process of building three more food trucks now. But I started uh, my business two years ago and my business grew so quickly. I started off with a smaller truck. And now Amy, Amy, actually, they, was, they were helping me with curbside when I had my smaller truck. And now I have a huge truck. You know, I have a full commercial kitchen with ovens and everything on my truck. And, uh, and Jordan, what you're doing, um, I just want to extend myself to you if you ever need have the need for a, a, a bigger food truck or commercial to do your training or whatever. If I'm available, my truck will be available to you to do what you're doing because I believe in, 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 in what you're doing. And more importantly, I definitely believe in, in serving back to our veteran community um, because, you know, a lot of times we, people think just because we're, we're in the military, we're out of the military that we don't have needs, right? Because we go through careers and all the different things and, but they don't understand there's life after um, being in the military. So Remember. I appreciate what you're doing and anything I can do for you. Um, as it relates to my food truck, you just let me know. You'll have my contact um, as well. So, um, Adonis, what kind of food do you serve? I, I serve soul food. <laughs> right on. And so, interestingly enough, um, you know, for me, branding, um, I'm a branding marketing person, right? And a good thing about soul food, Jason, is that it could be a, a variety of things, right? So, depending on my audience or where I'm going, I could be doing shrimp, seafood, chicken, pork chops, whatever, because of soul food. Now, if I had a taco truck, guess what? You're only thinking about tacos. If I had a burger <laughs> truck, you're thinking about burgers. So I kind of like the cuisine that we have, not because it's soul food, but it gives me the opportunity to really get some good down-home, good recipes and get people out, mm -hmm. and I can change my menu anytime. All right. So that's, delicious. That's, that's I'm just going to say that. You yeah. guys are, if you're ever, you know, in, in Maryland, you have to hook up with Adonis. Listen, I've been oh. in Indonesia for a year. You guys are making my mouth water. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so, so I'm here to to answer um, any questions. I, I think that sorry more for like, Jason. Yeah, like like I said earlier, 
um, it's, it's a lot of work. There's a lot of work, and people don't understand the work that it takes to, um, to A, build the food truck, but more importantly, to operate one. They just see the lines, and they see the people, and they see the money transpiring, but they don't understand that, fully understand the background, and that's why I'm here um, to answer any questions or concerns you guys may have. Um, I'm, well, I think this is just extraordinary, right? I mean, you know, we, we think about what's happened in the restaurant industry in the last, you know, in the last year. I, I read things that say that, that two-thirds of the restaurants in America are going to be out of business you know, by, by December 31st, right? And meanwhile, you, you guys are printing money. I mean, this, food trucks are a growth industry, and, and the, the, the COVID pandemic is only, you know, has only really kicked it in the pants, right? So, I mean, Amy, how, how have you guys, and, and, and Jordan too, how has your business model had to change as, as, yeah. as a consequence of COVID? Like, what, well, what, how'd you guys flex to this? Well, I, I will tell you, um, March, middle of March, when, when commercial lights went out, I, I, I really did start to panic. I'm like, this is my <laughs> yeah, entire everybody. Business. there's not one person at work right now. Yes, yeah. everybody, not just myself. I, yeah. You know, yeah. Everybody was, was, you know, really f- trying to pivot and figure out their businesses. But I was thinking to myself, okay, I have to move to residential, multifamily, single family homes. Mm-hmm. That, that's where I need to provide opportunities for our partners. And so I very quickly realized there is an enormous opportunity in high rises and that, you know, working with the Bazudos and the gray stars and the Brookfields and, and, you know, some of them may or may not be familiar. JBG, if any of you live in, you know, multi, you know, high rises, you're, you're familiar with those names and yep, there we go. Nick, where do you, which one do you live in? Is it in DC? It was, we just moved into a single family home, but for the first seven months of the pandemic, there were food trucks outside of uh, our Midtown high-rise condo in Alexandria. There's your connection. Yeah, right there. of course. Yeah. So we and we discovered that there was a couple of things happening in in the multifamily properties. Number one, uh, programming is so difficult, so so difficult. I mean, typically the property managers are looking to create really nice amenities for the people that live in their building, and they were so limited. The gyms are closed. The amenity spaces are closed. How do they figure out a way to create a sense of belonging and community when everything is shut down? And you cannot you cannot congregate together. What's left? And there, the people that are living in the buildings are sick of cooking, and they're sick of the delivery fees, and they need something fresh. And they have children. Many of the families are homeschooling kids, and it just gets boring and monotonous. I mean, no differently than any of us feel every night. So the food trucks have become like, wow, this is amazing. They're almost like these little unicorns that pull up that people are just so excited about. So when I realized, look, there is a a really nice opportunity here, I I went after it. I'm like, I am going to aggregate as many uh, multifamily properties on our platform as I possibly can to then provide opportunities to our food truck partners. And so it's really been a game changer. When commercial lights, whenever that may be, there's no magic date, come back on. I think that in some ways it's been a blessing um, in disguise for me, because now I will have not only our residential portfolio, but when the commercial people come back, we'll have both. And I think that we're, the way I look at it, we're giving more opportunity to our food truck owners at that point. So that's gotcha. how we pivoted. Um, you know, and I, and I think just one more quick point, I think when the commercial, uh, when people do come back to work, I know with my husband, he's like, you know, there are, nobody's allowed in the buildings right now, except for the people that work there. So people aren't going to want to go back and forth and go out for lunch and, and delivery people are not allowed into the buildings. You have to come downstairs and get your food. You got to go to them. Yeah. And I think people are going to be real excited to see people like Adonis pull up. Well, Adonis, how has the view from inside the truck changed, you know, since, since the beginning of the year, it must, must be dramatic. It has been um, because, you know, not just we're, we're safety conscious, but the consumer is as well. And, you know, when you look at the food truck model itself, you know, you're in your mind, you're like, okay, some of the hype around a food truck, Jason is standing in line, right? And going mm-hmm. and, and saying what's trendy and what's good. And so yeah. now, you know, you have to really, as a consumer, you have to really shift your paradigm and say, I need to be six feet apart. And so what happens, and it's, and it's ironic enough that Amy and those guys, they launched their mobile app, like literally just in time for, for us as food truck owners. Because now, as she was mentioning her platform, it gives us a, a clearer view, Jason, that now it's better because they bridged the gap of my problem. The problem is before I COVID, can't read the menu. I'm too far away from it. Or more <laughs> importantly, I can't read it, but I can't order. Right. Yeah. But yeah. now 
I have to stand in line behind a hundred people. But now yeah. with the platform that Amy and those I guys have built, yeah. all I got, it's easy for me, Jason, because all I have to do is look at the thing and say, okay, um, Amy's picking up her food at 8.15, and this is what it is, and it's already ready for her. Amy comes down, gets her food, everybody's happy. People are not uh, congregating in front of the window. People are not concerned about people not wearing masks. We don't have any of those issues. So for us, it, it was it was rough initially, but uh -huh. as people adapted to the way we have to do uh, business from a safety perspective, it kind of changed. And then comes, like I said, Amy and their platform, which makes it that much more easier for us. Um, and, and Adonis, I, think, I think you bring up a really good point. I think culture has just changed overall. And, and I think, it, you know, everybody can, you know, has their own feelings about this, but, but people just expect when they go to a restaurant now to order from QR codes, you know, the, the places that I've been to, you know, you yep. sit outside, you scan codes. I mean, I, I, no one hands you a menu anymore. People are ordering from their phones. I don't know how, and if that will ever go away, even if there is a vaccine, I think people are going to be kind of getting used to this and, and maybe even liking it. So it's benefits to it. So, so when you think about that, you think about how now the, the industry itself has created a different demand. And, I, and I'll use an example. In the last seven, six years, the most, uh, the most growth on Facebook and social media were people 50 years and older. Prior to that, right, yeah. they didn't want anything to do with it. But they adapted to the way that they needed to communicate and see their family, right? So yeah. now what you're saying is now people are now understanding that they have to embrace technology that they were resisting just to get something to eat or to go somewhere. Right. Mm -hmm. So now for us being in the position that we're in, we've already been doing what we need to do. But now the consumer has shifted their paradigm to adapt to technology and we don't have to convince them that this is the best path and a more efficient way to get stuff done. So, I, yeah. you know, for me, it, it, it's, it's, it, they did a lot of work. COVID forced a lot of people to adapt to a different lifestyle that I didn't have to com convince them to do. It, and and it, improvise and overcome. <laughs> Amen. Yeah, hey, Jordan. Right. Jordan, okay, so so uh, Chow. Now, now, wh when when did you get started with that? Was that back at MIT in law school? Like, how how long has that idea been percolating? Yeah, I mean, the per the idea has been percolating a while. We got our IRS status actually January 2020, but um, like like many of you moving around in the military, I moved uh, I think five times in seven years, and and every time it got harder and harder to engage in the community, um, find a place to serve the community, and at some point near our last few moves, my wife and I were like, well. We're only going to be here for nine months. You know, let's, we're just probably not going to, you know, I'm not going to go coach football like I normally do. And I wanted to start a nonprofit. And then I decided merging my love of cooking uh, with it. And, you know, I was a submarine officer. I love the culinary specialists on the boat. They were the best people. Uh, and a lot of them, I'd watch them get out and just struggle, um, not really find jobs at Chipotle even. And they were five-year veterans, leadership, like fighting fires and also cooking you eggs in the morning uh, perfectly. And I just couldn't bear to see that. So that's when I decided in December of 2019 that I would, hey, I'm a law student. I know how to file this paperwork. Did it in a month, um, started branding it myself. And then people just flooded in with, hey, I can create your logo. Uh, let me help you with the website. Uh, here's how you should do this. And it's just grown like that. And, and as a business, like we're talking about food trucks with, with Amy and Adonis and, and we're part of that too, but we're, we're a training business. And, and what I had to do to adapt with COVID was I had to change the way we decided to do things. Um, selling to patrons was getting difficult with managing our systems of how we were taking orders, but also how we were expecting patrons to behave. Uh, so rather than, you know, make 50 meals maybe uh, over the course of four or five hours of selling, we now have linked up with homeless shelters and foster uh, care homes to say, we know we need to produce 200 meals. Uh, you need it on this day. We have a kitchen. Let's simulate a restaurant environment. Let's do training evolutions. Let's go. Uh, it's important because we are seeing that restaurants are not as open to apprenticeships for culinary students right now, many of them veterans. So the veterans who are at, for example, Anne Arundel, Anne Arundel Community College's culinary arts program can't get into a restaurant for an apprenticeship that they need, yet they can get into our kitchens because we're a much more controlled environment with the regulations. So we're continuing to adapt, continuing to train. And that's really the challenges we saw right away is we, don't, we did not want to stop um, with what we wanted to do with, with the training and with getting ready and, and doing things like that. So we've actually been structuring it where, for example, uh, the Blue Ribbon Program um, takes care of, of foster children and we're making 200 oatmeal chocolate chip cookies for the holidays. That is a training evolution in portioning. 
Uh, it may not seem like a big deal to you, but portioning is very important. And that's a very much a training evolution we need to get out. But we're not only just training the veteran in that very discreet skill, we're giving 200 cookies to kids who really need them in the holidays. So that, that's really how we're adapting and going. The last thing that I want to mention too is we're seeing businesses like Amazon increase 100% in their profits and big corporations are really thriving during the pandemic. Uh, what about small businesses? We all know that story. Chow is actually striving to become uh, not only you know the first in what we do with training, but our trucks, um, I plan by 2021 to be the first solely sourced, not just farm to table, but better known businesses. We have a guy who makes sauces in Philadelphia. We have a farm in Brandywine, Maryland. We're looking for a butcher. We want to get everything that's on your plate from a veteran small business. So that's, that's really what we're looking for. And that's how we want to be different because in a lot of ways, um, like, you know, we're, we're a competitor in the industry somehow, but also we, we want to remain, remain uh, our object and purpose as being a 501c3, as being a nonprofit. So we have values that we want to keep. And Thank those are the two things we're, we're pushing. So Jordan, help me understand what, what it seems to be a, a, a key decision that you must have made early on. When, when you describe uh, at the beginning, when you describe sort of the, the, the list of services that you guys uh, provide, it... It sounds like you you could very easily be a, uh, a you know a franchising operation, right? So, but you chose to be to, to to become a nonprofit instead. What what drove that decision? Like why 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 a nonprofit instead of a franchising operation? Yeah, that's a really good question. Yeah. Um, what we have uh, we have pro bono right. partners at DLA Piper, um, so they're they're actually the premier law uh, franchising law firm in the nation, and we sent them our draft FDDs and all the things you need to become a franchise, and we thought if this starts out as a nonprofit, we can, can, we can transition to a benefit corporation, uh, like a B Corp, and then we can franchise the trucks. And we started to think about what our mission was, what we cared about. And we saw far too many predatory schemes for veterans uh, in franchise uh, agreements. Mm -hmm. So we shifted that legal document to be a licensure agreement, which is less restrictive. There is no non-compete clause because at the end of the day, we actually want them to get out there and start their own trucks. Um, so it's mm -hmm. simpler for us, but it's also allows them the max flexibility to go do their own thing. And that, that, at the end of the day, that's truly what I started Chow for. Um, could I have a fleet of trucks in a franchise format at some point? Maybe. I mean, I, I feel like I've done things in the past where I prove people wrong. Maybe, maybe I'll do this and, and excel at it. But um, at the end of the day, like I know exactly what I want Chow to be. And my board, uh, luckily enough, supports me in that. So between the two of us, our entities, we're, we're striving to do something slightly a little bit different, but the transition to a B Corp in the future, I think is a possibility, but we want to prove that we're viable and our training system is, you know, is sound first. And then, you know, we can do the things like McDonald's does and send you to Hamburger University and we can send you to Chow University and you can get your training and then we can ship you out as a franchisee. <clears throat> but at the end of the day, we don't want to lose that touch uh, that we have with every veteran, which is us being hands-on with them and caring about them, not just caring about the royalties that we would get later. So, so what is then the, the, your, your primary source of operating revenue? Is it donations? Do you, do you charge a fee for the training? How, how, does, how does that work? Yeah, it's donations as primary grants. Uh, also, now that we have filed an IRS Form 990, we're open to a lot of different grants and structures like that. Um, so we do actually, um, we have large corporate partners that will sponsor us for events. We've actually secured a corporate partner for the entire year uh, for next year for Kitchen with a Mission. So we don't have to go after an individual corporation every time we want to cook meals for the homeless and train some veterans. We have that training program done. Um, what I've found is the idea, uh, it, it honestly, is what drives people. And, and you know, at, at the end of the day, when we get our truck, so when we raise that money and buy our first truck in 2021, the operating revenue from that is going to come to us. Uh, that that will be ours, and the veteran will take away as a 99 employee their 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 time. But they're they're basically getting paid to train and to get this food truck MBA that we talk about. So we don't want to charge gotcha. them them to earn what they what they make through their labor but also get the great training and then the revenue um from the trucks will come will come to us once we start having you know trucks and sending them out so gotcha. they're pretty much like you know schools but also make us revenue through the sales. so say i'm a say i'm a mess cook in the navy right and I'm, I'm i get out in three months and i want to i want to get into food trucks so uh, i connect with chow what what does my experience look like like how, how, what's my path from taking off my uniform to you know op opening up the window you know, like, like Adonis does in the morning and, and serving my customers from my truck. What's that look like? Yeah. 
Yeah, uh, let's say let's say you're local to the DMV to make it make it easier for this this analysis. But we have a digital training platform which we're developing right now. So it's it's in a completely digital first year culinary school program that we're working with Anne Arundel Community College to develop. Um, you can actually complete all of that with feedback from us on all the assignments, and we are going to require that for knowledge factors and things that you need to get signed off. And I mentioned your PQS; it's a qualification card, pretty much. You need to complete those first before you come to our in-person training. Then you'll have to do kitchen with a mission training. That is whenever you are doing the simulated environments, cooking the meals for the homeless. When you get enough under instructs through that program, you can then step into the truck itself. Uh, in between all of this, we get you serve safe qualified. So we actually work with you to get the proper qualifications through the National Restaurant Association to handle food. Uh, and then from there, once you step into the truck, it, it's a little bit like, uh, I don't know if there's any seals in the room, but it's your post buds, it's your S S SQT time. What's well, okay, we got you past the initial phase. Now it's really time to teach you how to do it. And, and that's what we do is like, this is the business side of it. This is the food truck operations. And then from there, they can continue on in that role as long as they feel comfortable. But the whole goal is to them to step out on their own. We want to have them to gain the confidence in order to start their own business. So that timeline can look anything from six months to two years, depending on their prior culinary training and depending on their comfortability of operating a business. But we are there when that, that stops, but we are there also after as every alumni we have, we are actually working with every time they come back to us. So that's the thing we're trying to build lifelong partnerships with them too. Amy, you, you talked about, you know, the, the buildings and the, you know, the building management and sort of organizing the business around that. What about the city? I mean, I, I, I watched the food truck thing happen in Chicago, right? I mean, we went from, from crazy little taco trucks to, you know, cordon bleu on wheels, right? And uh, those guys have a hard time, f you know, figuring out where to park, uh, where they're not going to get moved along by the cops, right? So, so is, that, is that part of what you do? Do you, do you organize, you know, permitting from the city and, you know, all, all, all that stuff? Yeah, so the, the truth is cities are a little more difficult. And I'll, I'll use Washington, D.C. as just an example. Um, it's based huh. upon a lottery <clears throat> and, you know, the trucks put their names in, in, in the hat, so to speak. And a certain number of trucks are pulled from that lottery and they're permitted to vend in certain areas within D.C. It's very, very difficult in the cities to vend. Um, very challenging. They're, they're all over the city, but they're in spots that are obviously, you know, they're allowed to park. We help our food truck owners with getting licensed, with getting insured, with getting their COIs, et cetera. We help educate them on how to do all that. The spots that we provide to our food truck owners are on private property. So we really just deal with buildings. That we, we really stay away from the city as much as we possibly can, unless there's particular sense. buildings that have private parking. But I, I don't, I don't particularly you know, work with the city in and itself. It's just too complicated and there's too many rules and regulations. And I, I you know, a lot of the trucks that vend in the city, <laughs> it's like the, the food truck mafia, so to speak. Um, you know, it's, it's a well, tough I, business, very cutthroat, very Jason, cutthroat. Jason, that was gonna be, that was gonna be my question. I work, uh, I work right on the Washington Navy Yard and it's very competitive out there. One, spots are hard to get and they're always fighting. And then you, we watch the local news within the district, you know, uh, the permits, and it, it's, it seems to be a bit much for some an upcoming person, entrepreneur, you know, business operator to go in there. So that's um, right. I, I think you're smart to kind of uh, help them get in a good market because uh, I think that's what Jason was getting at. You know, it's, it seems competitive. Yeah, I mean, oh, yeah. think about it. Like, an Adonis can, you know, how much yeah. time can he spend on finding spots? Like, if he's calling property managers and landlord partners and event planners and, and you can't and, be cooking while you're doing that. Can't be cooking. Right. You need to be booking. <laughs> so, <laughs> right. I mean, Adonis, would you agree with that? I, mean, I forget curbside kitchen. Just take your like in your day to day. Like, how much time do you spend looking for spots? It's not easy. Uh, so, so the good thing for me is that um, once again, uh, and that, it's not just because Amy is here, but just more more importantly for me and our business is that we 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 fulfill that niche market. Like, we're not the food truck that you're going to find on the street, right? Because you know, and I tell people this all the time, and it's, a, it's a, just a word <clears> of wisdom. <throat> um, just as a consumer, you know, any food truck that's on the street five or six days a week, I tell you, don't even don't even eat off of, don't even eat there. And the reason why I say that, guys, is because it takes me literally a day to clean my food truck, right? Because I have to sanitize and clean it all the way through. 
Mm-hmm. Now, the point for I'm, I'm I'm about to get at is this. You know, food trucks on the street, like they don't they're so focused on money that they're not even focused on anything else. And in the D.C. area, more specifically, you know, it, it, it's, it's, it's a mafia, but it's also political. But at the end of the day, you know, um, they spend so much time trying to fight over uh, spots and what's the best spot to go to. that They don't really think about the customer experience. They think about how they're going to how they're going to make money. Mm-hmm. Um, so I don't even do I don't even I don't even you'll never see my truck on the street. Either I'm doing an event or I'm going to an area that um, uh, uh, where I'm going to a different a specific clientele base. Um, but I will say this, though. D.C. is a very difficult place to get in. Yeah, they have all these regulations about how big your truck needs to be and all these different things. They have a lottery that you have to go through and then nobody really. So what happens is that they say, OK, your lottery is on 19th and F. Right. And so the people in the lottery, they go park their trucks there, but then they'll have a, on 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 19th and G. You will have a whole line of food trucks over there who are not in the lottery. So you have that issue. But I will say that for me, I only stay pretty much in Montgomery County in the Maryland area because their regulations are a little more loose and they're more business friendly as opposed to some areas. And, in, in, you know, you got to go through all these regulations. And to Jordan's point earlier about understanding the um, legalities of it, um, you know, Merlin came up, I don't know how long ago, Jordan, maybe you know the date, but it was a few years back where they now have reciprocity because before you would have to go to each um, each county and they have different regulations, different health. You got to go through the different, but now they have reciprocity. So once you get established in one, within 90 miles, you can go to another one and it's apply for reciprocity, put your plan together. They go over your plan, they look at your truck and they give you a license. And there's not so much having to pay $700 for every county or place you want to get um Get, be able to be a food truck vendor in. You spend most of your time in Anne Arundel County? No, Montgomery. Montgomery, Montgomery County. County? Yeah. All right, all right. And, and yeah. we, they can find you on Curbside Kitchen. Donna, when, when we come to your truck, what's the what's the one thing we got to order? Oh, man, you would say that, right? Jeez. <laughs> Jason, um, I think everybody really loves our fish, right? Because it's not something you're going to find in the store. All the batters are made by me. And we have this sauce that we call Malia sauce that everybody loves. We, right. we originally made it for seafood, but people put it on hamburgers. They dip their french fries in chicken. <laughs> so I, I would say fish is definitely, our, and crab cakes is definitely our, our specialty, my guy. Fair enough. You guys heard it here. <laughs> All right. All right, guys. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for coming to tell us about this. I mean, sure. yeah, it's a recurrent theme here, right? How do you thrive through this mess? And Boy, uh, if that is one industry that is just going absolutely bonkers, I mean, I uh, um, uh, that's it's 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 one one of those ones you want to be in. So so thanks for telling us the story. 